All right, uh, welcome back from the break, everyone. Uh, our last talk of the morning will be, will be from Dr. Ryan Lagerquist. Uh, he is a postdoc at NOAA CIRA uh, here in Boulder and recently graduated from the University of Oklahoma. And today he'll be talking about decision trees and their ensembles. All right, can you hear me? Okay, I'm I'm assuming that uh, that people can hear me, since I'm not um, I'm not getting messages in the chat or anything. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about decision trees and ensembles of decision trees. My contact information is up here, so there's my Twitter handle, my Twitter handle, and my email, uh, in case you would like to get in contact with me after the talk. So I'm going to start off with talking about the theory of decision trees. And then I'll show you some practical examples of a really basic decision tree and then a slightly fancier decision tree. And then I'll talk about the ensembles of decision trees, which are random forests and gradient boosted forests. And then we'll conclude with a summary and a list of applications throughout atmospheric science. So a decision tree is a flow chart that looks like this thing at the bottom where you have branch nodes, which are the black ellipses, and then leaf nodes, which are the black rectangles at the bottom. So I should note, this is a very contrived example. This isn't an actual decision tree that I trained. It's just a simple example that I made for explanation purposes. So in this contrived example, the prediction task is uh, you're taking one storm and you're predicting the probability that this storm will produce severe weather at some point in the future. And at each one of these branch nodes, the decision tree is asking a question about the storm. Mm -hmm. So you feed the storm from the top of the decision tree down through the branches. And for each question, if the answer is no, you feed the storm down the left branch or the uh, red arrow. And if the answer is yes, you feed the storm down the right branch or the green arrow. Mm -hmm. um, so this, uh, this top question, we, we call this the root node, the branch node at the very top. So the top question is about CAPE or convective available potential energy. If CAPE is greater than or equal to 1500 joules per kilogram, the storm goes down to the right through the green arrow. And if CAPE is less than 1500 joules per kilogram, the storm goes down to the left through the red arrow. So let's say you have a storm, you've asked the first question at the root node and the answer was yes, CAPE is greater than 1500 joules per kilogram. So you go down the green arrow and now you've gone down to the child node. And the next question you ask about the storm is on downdraft CAPE. And you're asking, is the downdraft cape greater than or equal to 1,000 joules per kilogram? And in this case, let's say the answer is no. Let's say the downdraft cape is only 500 joules per kilogram. So you go down the red arrow, and you've reached a leaf node or a terminal node. Once you reach a leaf node, you stop passing the storm through the tree, and the leaf node will give you the prediction that you want. So in this case, the prediction is 0.1 or 10% probability of severe weather in the future. If the answer to this question about downdraft cape had been yes, let's say the downdraft cape was 1200 joules per kilogram, you would have gone down the right arrow to this other leaf node that says F equals 0 0.6, and your answer would have been 60% probability of severe weather in the future. So that's how a decision tree works once you've trained it at inference time, when you have a new example and you want to make a prediction for that example. So you'll have noticed that the branch nodes are all bifurcating, which means they're only binary. So they ask a question to which the answer is yes or no. There's only two possible answers. So you can go down to the left or you can go down to the right, depending on whether the answer is yes or no. And then the leaf nodes, the rectangles at the very end of the tree are terminal. So once you've reached a leaf node, you stop. And that leaf node gives you the prediction for the storm that you care about. Um, so this means that each branch node, each one of the ellipses has two children. There's a left child and a right child, and each leaf node has zero children because at that point you just stop going. And uh, like I said earlier, just to clarify the point again, predictions are made at the leaf nodes and questions are asked about the storm or about whatever, whatever example you have at the branch nodes. So decision trees have been used in meteorology since the 1960s. The earliest example I could find was 1968. But back in the 1960s and also the 70s and most of the 1980s as well, decision trees were crafted by hand. Uh, they were often used to predict fog. That was a really popular application for decision trees. So they would ask questions about the dew point depression, which is the difference between the temperature and the dew point. They would ask questions about the wind speed, uh, things like that. 
So these decision trees were created subjectively by human experts who knew a lot about fog, and then they would use those decision trees in the future to predict whether or not there was going to be fog at a certain location. Uh, and then in the 1980s, an objective algorithm called C3.4, I think it was, was developed by Quinlan in 1986. This objective algorithm is used to train decision trees automatically from data. So now we're getting into machine learning. So the original decision trees back in the 1960s were not machine learning. They were human-based expert systems. They were just a way that human knowledge was being codified into this sort of tree structure. But then in 1986, when we got this objective algorithm, C3.4, decision trees transition into the realm of machine learning, and we can now train them in an automated way from data. Um, and what training means in this case, the parameters of a decision tree are the questions that you ask at each branch node. So each branch node has two parameters that you can choose from. The first parameter is the predictor variable that you're asking the question about. So if you look at the root node here at the top, that predictor variable is CAPE. And then the second parameter at each branch node is the threshold that you're asking about. So for the branch node up here, that second parameter is 1500 joules per kilogram. And then if you go down to the left child, there's two parameters here as well. The predictor variable is one parameter, that's maximum reflectivity inside the storm. And then the second parameter is that threshold on maximum reflectivity, which in this case is 65 dBZ. Um, so for this decision tree that I'm showing you here, there's uh, four different branch nodes, which means there's eight different parameters or eight different trainable weights, if you will, inside the model. Um, so when you finally get down to a leaf node and the decision tree makes a prediction for a new storm, the prediction made at that leaf node, at leaf node L, is the average over all training examples that reach leaf node L. So let's say you had 100 training examples, or um, sorry, let me back up a little bit. Uh, let's go to this, uh, this leaf node at the bottom right where it says F equals 0 0.6. So let's say that during the training process, when you had, uh, you had a bunch of previous storms and you were using those to train your decision tree, you already knew the correct answer for each storm. So you knew it was either a yes, as in it uh, produced severe weather in the future, or a no, as in it didn't produce severe weather. Let's say during the training process, 100 storms reached this leaf node labeled F equals 0 0.6. Um, F equals 0 0.6 means that 60 out of those 100 storms that reached this leaf node ended up producing severe weather. So 60 over 100 is 0 0.6. That's how you got that answer. If we go to the leaf node that's just to the left of that, where it says F equals 0 0.1, if 50 training examples reach this leaf node, that means only 5 of the 50 produce severe weather. So 5 over 50 is 10% or 0 0.1. So that's how you get these answers. You just look at all the training examples that, uh, oops, I went backwards. Um, you look at all the training examples that reach the leaf node, and then you just take the percentage that produce severe weather and you say, okay, there's my predicted probability that this new storm is going to produce severe weather if it also reaches that leaf node. Um, and I should note, the example I'm showing here is a classification example. So as, uh, as Dort discussed in her lecture about an hour ago, she was uh, talking about the difference between regression and classification. So for classification, you're predicting a category, you're predicting a qualitative thing. Um, in this case, for the example that I'm showing in the little schematic, we're doing binary classification. So the answer is always yes or no. It's either the storm produced severe weather or the storm didn't produce severe weather. But you can also do regression with decision trees. With regression, you're predicting a real continuous value, often uh, one that can range from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, so let's say uh, a, a regression task that's, uh, that's closely related to the example I'm showing here would be the, uh, the size of hail that the storm is going to produce in the future. So if you cared about the exact size of hail, that would be a regression problem. So the exact size of hail could be 1.5 centimeters, 3.3 centimeters, 4.41673 centimeters, et cetera, et cetera. It's a continuous value. Um, Whereas if you wanted to turn that hail problem into a classification problem, you could, uh, you could predict whether the storm is going to produce severe hail and uh, whatever, th there's, there's lots of different ways that you could define severe uh, in the United States as one inch or 2.54 centimeters in diameter. So in that case, it would become a classification problem where you're predicting either, yes, this storm will produce hail over one inch 
or no, this storm won't produce hail over one inch. Um, so anyways, the take home point of all that, decision trees can be used for regression or classification. They can also be used for multi-class classification and not just binary classification like the example I'm showing here. Um, so during training, I've, I've told you a little bit about the training procedure. I've told you that there's two parameters at each branch node. There's the predictor variable you ask about, and then there's the threshold you set on that predictor variable. But I didn't tell you how those, uh, how those parameters are picked during the training procedure. So what happens is that the, uh, the training algorithm, that C, C3.4 algorithm from Quinlan 1986, it will loop over all the predictor variables you have available. So for this case, let's say you have 100 different predictor variables. The training algorithm will loop over those 100 different predictor variables, and it'll loop over a whole bunch of different possible thresholds for each predictor variable. So for Kate, for example, the training algorithm might try questions like, uh, is Cape greater than 1,000 joules per kilogram, and then 1,050, and 1,100, and 1,150, and 1,200, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll loop over a whole bunch of different combinations of predictor variable and then threshold on that variable. And the training algorithm will figure out which one of those questions maximizes the information gain. Um, so for regression, the way you determine the, the best, in the, the maximum information gain is you minimize mean squared error. So for the hail size example I was talking about on the last slide, the mean squared error would be the mean squared difference between the predicted and actual values for hail size. So you want to um, you want to get your predicted hail sizes as close as possible to the actual hail sizes that occurred. For classification, when you maximize information gain, you minimize something called the remainder, which is based on the entropy of the child nodes. So I'll unpack that a little bit on the, uh, the next slide here. When I say child nodes, um, if you're looking at the root node here, so that node at the top where it says is Cape at least 1500 joules per kilogram, the child nodes of this node are the ones that the arrows point to. So the, uh, the, the left child and the, the right child at the next level of the tree. Um, so the entropy of one branch node or, or one node in general inside the decision tree is defined by this equation. Um, I apologize for the math. I think this is going to be the only slide with equations. You don't have to worry about getting bombarded here. Uh, so the entropy of one node in the tree is defined by this equation that has a couple of logarithms in it. So n here in the, uh, in the denominator outside the brackets is just the number of examples that reach this node in the tree. And then f is the fraction of those examples that are in the positive class, assuming we're doing binary classification where the only possible classes are yes or no. So f is the fraction of these examples that are in the yes class. So for the severe weather example I was showing in this little schematic, n would be the number of storms that reach the given node, and then f would be the fraction of those storms that ended up producing severe weather or severe hail if you want to, um, if you want to go with that example. And then, so after we, we have this equation that defines the entropy at one node of the tree, and then we have this value that's called the remainder. So it's n left e left plus n right e right over n left plus n right. So I'll unpack that a little bit. N left is the number of examples or the number of storms in this case that get sent down to the left child. N right is the number of examples that get sent down to the right child. And then E left is the entropy of the left child and E right is the entropy of the right child. So to, um, to explain this conceptually, again, let's go to the root node where the question being asked is, uh, is Cape greater than or equal to 1500 joules per kilogram? So we ask that question, we send all the no cases down the left branch to the left child, then we send all the yes cases to down the right branch to the right child. And then after doing that, we look at the entropy inside the, the left child node, which is that one that says uh, maximum reflectivity, at least 65 dBZ. And we also look at the entropy of the, uh, the examples that get sent down to the right child that asks the question about downdraft cape. Um, so if if, if this question at the root node about Cape being uh, at least 1500 joules per kilogram, if this perfectly separated the storms that produce severe and non-severe weather, let's just assume the problem was that simple. So let's say all storms with Cape greater than 1500 joules per kilogram produce severe weather, and all storms with Cape less than 1500 joules per kilogram don't produce severe weather. 
In that case, we have a perfect split or a pure split. That one question alone allows us to answer um, in perfectly which storms produce severe weather and which ones don't. In that case, the entropy at, uh, at both of the child nodes would be zero, and this remainder term would be zero, and we would choose Cape greater than or equal to 1500 joules per kilogram as the best question to, to split the examples at this node. And in that case, you'd have a really simple decision tree because once you have pure child nodes, if you've got, um, if the left node contains only non-severe storms and the right node only contains severe storms, then you would just stop training and we would have a decision stump as it's called, where you're only asking one question and then you have two leaf nodes. Um, but in this case, I'm assuming that the Cape, Cape greater than 1500 joules per kilogram question doesn't split the storms perfectly, which means that we need to keep asking questions and keep going down the tree. But in any case, uh, for, a, for a binary classification problem, like a, a, a yes or no question, this is the criterion that you use to judge the goodness of each possible split. So that's how a decision tree is trained. So now I'm going to move on to section two, and I'm going to show you a default decision tree. When I say default, I mean a decision tree that's trained in Python with just the default hyperparameters. Um, and to go back for anyone who missed Dorit's lecture about an hour ago or anyone who's just forgotten the definition of hyperparameter, a hyperparameter is a setting for a machine learning model that can't be altered during the training process. So we talk about parameters and hyperparameters. The parameters are these questions for a decision tree anyways. The parameters are these questions inside each branch node that are, that, that are tweaked during the training procedure. So the training procedure determines what the, the best parameters are, what the best questions to are, to, what the best questions are to ask at each branch node. Um, but for any machine learning algorithm, there's certain hyperparameters, which are decisions that you have to make a priori. So for example, in a neural net, the number of layers is a hyperparameter that can't be changed during training. Um, for a decision tree, the maximum depth is a hyperparameter that can't be changed during training. It's something you have to decide beforehand. Um, so for this default decision tree that I'm showing you, I've trained it in Python with the, the default hyperparameters. And I've used a class from uh, the scikit-learn library. It's called sklearn.tree.decisiontree classifier. There's a link in this PDF, which I think will be sent around to people afterwards. Um, but in case it's not, I have the full URL on the last page of this slideshow that you'll also be able to screenshot and then copy into your browser. So the code for any of the examples that I end up showing in these slides is all available online. It's in a Jupyter notebook, so everyone can see it. Um, and in this case, the example that I'm using is uh, I'm training a decision tree to predict whether a storm will develop strong rotation in the future. And I've defined strong rotation by this threshold on the vorticity. And the threshold ended up being about point zero, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the threshold ended up being about 0 0.004 inverse seconds. Um, so here I'm looking at three different evaluation graphics. On this slide, I'm looking at the three evaluation graphics for the training data. And on the next slide, I'm looking at the three evaluation graphics for the validation data. And there's a point to that because you're going to see some, uh, some overfitting. So for this single decision tree that I've trained, I've plotted on the uh, left hand side a rock curve. I think you'll learn a little bit more about rock curves in a future lecture in the summer school. In the middle diagram, I've plotted a performance or so in the middle figure, I've plotted a performance diagram. And in the right figure, I've plotted an attributes diagram. Uh, so I know you haven't seen much of these yet, if at all. So I'm going to, um, at a very high level, I'm, I'm just going to try to explain them. So for a rock curve, uh, you always want to see a rock curve closer to the top left. So the perfect rock curve is one that goes up the y-axis to 1.0 and then goes across the x-axis. And in that case, the area underneath the curve would be one because you'd have a perfect rectangle that's one by one. So the way you judge the goodness of a rock curve is typically by looking at the area under the curve or the AUC. In this case, for the training data, the AUC is 0 0.955 out of a possible, um, the, the maximum possible value is one. So that's a really good AUC. Generally, if you have an AUC greater than 0 0.9, you call it an excellent model. Um, so we're seeing really good performance on the training data in terms of the rock curve. Then if we look at the performance diagram, what the performance diagram is plotting is probability of detection on the y-axis versus success ratio on the x-axis. 
So probability of detection is the fraction of storms that develop strong rotation that were also predicted to have strong rotation. And then success ratio is the fraction of storms with predicted strong rotation that ended up having strong rotation. Success ratio is also one minus the false alarm ratio. So in this case, you want success ratio to be high and you want probability of detection to be high. So you want your performance diagram to be as close to the top right as you can possibly get it. Um, and there's a couple of scores that you can contour in the background of a, of a performance diagram. So the dashed gray lines are frequency bias. You want that to be as close to one as possible. And then the blue contours are CSI or critical success index. Um, anyways, the take home point here, you want your rock curve to be as close as possible to the top left and your performance diagram to be as close as possible to the top right. And then finally, the figure we're seeing on the right hand side is called the attributes diagram. The perfect attributes diagram is one that follows the x equals y line. And in this case, the attributes diagram is absolutely perfect. So what we're showing on the x axis here is forecast probability. This is the uh, decision tree's predicted probability that the storm will develop strong rotation. And on the y-axis, we're seeing conditional event frequency. So this is telling you, um, given a forecast probability of x, uh, how, how often does the storm actually develop strong rotation in the future? So you want those two values to be equal. Uh, so for example, on the occasions where you forecast 20%, you want 20% of those storms to end up uh, developing strong rotation. When you forecast 60%, you want 60% of those storms to develop strong rotation. When you forecast 80%, you want the conditional frequency to be 80%. So you want this to fall the one-to-one -one line. And in this case, it falls the one-to-one -one line perfectly for the training data. Uh, there's a bunch of other reference lines and stuff in the background of this attributes diagram. And I'm just gonna gloss over those for now. You don't have to worry about them too much. Uh, this little histogram in the inset is a histogram of forecast probabilities. So this tells you how often the model forecasts uh, each, each probability available. So the vast majority of forecasts, 70% of them are between zero and 5% probability. And then there's a long right tail where the, the decision tree occasionally forecasts higher probabilities of strong rotation. In any case, what we're seeing for the training data is really, really good performance. This decision tree is doing a really good job and then if we look at the validation data, we see a pretty sharp decline in performance. So if you look at the left-hand figure here, the rock curve, you'll notice that it moves down towards the bottom right significantly, so it gets worse. If you look at the figure in the middle, the performance diagram, it moves down to the bottom left significantly, so it gets worse. And then if you look at the figure on the right-hand side, which is the attributes diagram for the training data, it's perfectly on the one-to-one -one line. It's a beautiful attributes diagram. And when you go to the validation data, it moves off the one-to-one -one line, and now you have an overprediction problem. So the performance is quite a lot better for the training data than the validation data, which is a, um, that's a sign of overfitting. And just to be specific here about the decrease in skill from training to validation data, the AUC or area under the rock curve has dropped by uh, 0 0.101 or 10%. Um, the maximum CSI in the performance diagram has dropped by 0 0.129. And uh, as for AUC, the maximum possible CSI is one. So a drop from 0 0.47 to 0 0.34 is a pretty big deal. The Briar skill score shown in the attributes diagram has dropped from 0 0.46 to 0 0.23. That's also a big deal because the maximum possible Briar skill score is one. So that's another big drop. And uh, in as I was alluding to in the attributes diagram, we had a perfectly reliable model that was following that X equals Y line, and it's now moved off that X equals Y line. And for almost every possible forecast probability, the, the conditional event frequency is less than the forecast probability. So if we look at this point here where forecast probability is 0 0.8, the conditional event frequency is only about 0 0.6. So that means in cases where you forecast 80% probability of strong rotation, only 60% of those storms end up developing strong rotation. So you're overpredicting. predicting. Um, this overfitting thing is a typical problem with single decision trees. And uh, I think I explained that on this slide. Yeah. Um, the, the problem with single decision trees is that they're, uh, they're very unstable because they depend on these hard thresholds. So if you look at the root node, for example, we're asking this question about CAPE. It's just a yes or no question based on a single threshold. Is CAPE at least 1500 joules per kilogram? You can imagine taking a storm that um, 
that has 1,501 joules per kilogram of CAPE and, and just, uh, just tweaking it to, to make it have 1,499 joules per kilogram of CAPE. And that's well within the measurement error for CAPE. The measurement error for CAPE that comes from, uh, from balloon soundings is probably on the order of 100 joules per kilogram. Um, so the difference between 1,499 and 1,501 is well within the measurement error. It's not statistically significant. So you, you can imagine a tiny measurement error um, causing a storm to be sent down the right side when it should be sent down the left side or vice versa. And that could really change the forecast probability. You could hold all other things about the storm equal, but just tweak the CAPE value due to measurement error and you could get a vast difference in what the forecast probability of severe weather is. So that makes single decision trees unstable and it makes them tend to overfit their training data, which means that they don't generalize well to new data. Um, one way you can control overfitting, and this is getting into section three, which is on the fancier decision tree, is you can limit the depth of your decision tree. So you can keep it from growing. Um, if, if you don't limit the depth of a decision tree, generally what happens is it keeps growing and growing and growing. And sometimes it, it can become 50 levels deep or 100 levels deep. And essentially it'll keep growing until every single leaf node is pure. What I mean by pure, uh, I think I explained this earlier, is that at every leaf node, either all the storms produce severe weather or all the storms don't produce severe weather. So every leaf node ends up having a forecast probability of 0% or 100%. So if you don't control depth, your decision tree will just grow infinitely until it's got all pure leaf nodes. But that causes a huge amount of overfitting. Um, so there's a few different hyperparameters that control the depth of a decision tree. For one thing, you can explicitly set a limit on the maximum depth. You can say, don't grow beyond five levels, don't grow beyond 10 levels, whatever it may be. Um, there's a couple other hyperparameters that I ended up playing with here in the example that I'm gonna show you. I played with the minimum sample size. In this case, sample size means number of storms or to be more general, number of examples. I played with the minimum sample size at a branch node and also the minimum sample size at a leaf node. So for example, if the minimum sample size at a leaf node is 100, if I've set that as my hyperparameter, that means during the training of the tree, if I get down to a node that has, one, that has 100 storms or less in it, I, I stop building the tree. I, I stop splitting and I just call that a leaf node. So I stop trying to ask more questions and split these storms into smaller and smaller bins. Um, so if you, if you set both of these values to both of the minimum sample sizes to one, that allows the tree to become infinitely deep. And then you end up with that crazy overfitting problem that I was just talking about where the tree could have a hundred levels or something. Um, you, you can think of this a different way as well. If there's only one example at each leaf node, every single prediction that you make in the future will be based on only one training example. So the forecast prob probability will be either zero out of one or one out of one. So 0% or 100%. Um, and when you have such a tiny sample size at every leaf node that you're basing your predictions on, we know that generally the smaller your sample size, the less generalizable your predictions are. So your predictions will not generalize well outside of the training data if each prediction is based on one example or a few examples. Um, the flip side of that is if you set these minimum sample sizes to be too high, the tree won't grow deep enough and that'll cause it to underfit. So there's a trade-off here between underfitting and overfitting. If you set the minimum sample size to one, you're gonna get crazy overfitting. Whereas if you set the minimum sample size to the size of the data set itself, say you've got 10,000 storms and you set the minimum sample size to 10,000, you're gonna have a dis decision stump where you're only gonna have a root node and you're only gonna be able to ask one question to split storms and then you're gonna end up dramatically underfitting unless you have a really ridiculously simple problem where somehow a CAPE threshold of 1500 joules per kilogram separates severe and non-severe storms, which we know doesn't happen in reality. So I'm gonna show you the uh, results of the hyperparameter experiment that I ran. This is also in the Jupyter notebook that I was talking about, which is linked at the end of the slides. So you'll be able to rerun this code interactively and play with it if you want, try new values, uh, whatever you, you care to do. Um, so what I'm showing here is AUC or area under the rock curve on the validation data. Just to reiterate, area under the rock curve is a good thing. It's something you want to be higher. It can vary between zero and one with one being the best possible score. So on the x-axis, I'm showing the minimum sample size per leaf node. And then sometimes people call branch nodes split nodes. I apologize for the 
switch in terminology halfway through. Um, on the y-axis, I'm showing minimum sample size per branch node. Um, and if you look at these, uh, these color values are showing what the AUC ends up being on validation data. And in this case, the best AUC happens with the highest minimum sample sizes. So when the minimum sample size is 200, uh, 200 storms at a leaf node and 500 storms at a branch node, you get a really good AUC on the validation data. So that tends to make the tree better at predicting the validation data. So it makes the tree overfit less when you increase these minimum sample sizes. And on the next couple slides, I'm just showing you some, I'm showing you the same graph, but I'm showing you different scores. So this one's showing area under rock curve. This next one is showing maximum CSI or critical success index, which is that thing contoured in blue in the performance diagram. And again, this is something that higher is better. And you can see that as you increase the minimum sample sizes, CSI becomes better. And the last score I'm showing you is Breyer skill score on the validation data. This is something that ranges between minus infinity and plus one with plus one being the perfect score. And again, you can see as you go to the top right of this diagram, you increase the minimum sample sizes, your Briar skill score gets better. So the whole takeaway of this is when you increase the minimum sample size per leaf node and per branch node, you end up with a shallower tree that can't overfit as much and it generalizes better to the validation data instead of predicting the training data really well, but then collapsing on the validation data. So I ended up picking the tree with the uh, highest Briar skill score on the validation data that had the highest minimum sample size as possible. So 500 per branch node, 200 per leaf node. And I'm showing results on the testing data. So Dorit in her lecture about an hour ago, I think talked about splitting data into three partitions, which are training, validation, and testing. So the training data are the data you use to fit the parameters of the model. The validation data is the data set you use to, to determine the hyperparameters, which in this case are those two minimum sample sizes. And then you hold out the testing results till the very, very end to do your final assessment of how good is this model? How good will it be in the wild if I ever send it out and uh, have it used in a weather forecasting office or something? Um, so here we're looking at the results on the testing data. The, um, the new decision tree that, that I've trained, it still overfits. I haven't shown the, the, um, the results on training or validation data, but they're a little better than what you're seeing here on the testing data. However, it overfits a lot less than the default tree that I was showing you earlier. You don't end up with a huge collapse. Uh, so in this case, our, our AUC shown in the rock curve at the left is 0 0.9, which is exactly the threshold for whether or not you call it an excellent model. I mean, that's kind of arbitrary, but it shows up in the literature a lot. The maximum CSI in the performance diagram is 0.423. For that default decision tree, when we went to validation data, the maximum CSI was only 0.34 or something like that. Um, and in the attributes diagram, we're, we don't have perfect reliability. We're not uh, perfectly following that X equals Y line, but we're pretty close. We're much better than we were for the, uh, the simple decision tree with the default hyperparameters without those minimum sample sizes. Um, so the, the whole take home point of section three is that by limiting the depth of the tree, which you can do by setting these minimum sample sizes, you uh, prevent the tree from overfitting quite as much. Although overfitting is still uh, a very common problem for single decision trees, and we haven't gotten rid of it by setting these minimum sample sizes. So what do we do next? So that brings us to section four, where I'm going to talk about random forests. And a random forest is an ensemble of decision trees. So this is another way that we can mitigate overfitting is by ensembling a bunch of decision trees together. Random forests are one way to do it. And then in section five, which is going to be the last section of my talk, I'm going to talk about gradient boosted forests, which are another way to do that. I'm also going to take a cough drop because my allergies are getting me. So, like I said, a random forest is an ensemble of decision trees. In the, uh, the single decision trees that I showed you in section two and then in section three, the, uh, the tree in section two had a lot of overfitting. The tree in section three had less overfitting, but it still had some. And um, as, oh, this is the, the slide where I put that explanation in text. So I was talking about how uh, a really small change in cape at the root node could, uh, could cause a massive difference between the predicted severe weather probability for your storm. So that, um, that kind of step function that exists in decision trees where every question is based on this hard threshold 
is the main reason that you get overfitting in a single decision tree. So yeah, training a bunch of decision trees is one way to mitigate this problem. The idea when you train an ensemble of decision trees is that you want each, each tree to be different than all the others. Um, or another way of saying that is you want the trees to be diverse. And if the trees are diverse enough, you hope that they have that they overfit in different ways and that their biases offset each other. So you hope that when you ensemble a whole bunch of decision trees, like a hundred or a thousand of them, even though each individual decision tree overfits, when you ensemble them together, you hope that those biases offset each other and you're no longer overfitting. So there's two different ways to ensure this diversity inside a random forest. One way is called example bagging, which some people call bootstrapping, you'll see why. And another way is called predictor bagging. Some people call this feature bagging or some people also call it subsetting. Um, so in this little figure here that I've taken from someone else's paper, you can see on the left hand side, there's the original training set. So let's say your original training set has a thousand storms. For each decision tree, you bootstrap this training set. So you create a bootstrap replicate of 1000 storms and you use that bootstrap replicate, you use one bootstrap replicate to train the first tree and then you bootstrap again and train the second tree. And then you bootstrap again and train the third tree, et cetera, et cetera, for every single tree. Um, so that, that first point is, uh, is what I just said on the last slide. So for a training set with N examples, let's say N is a thousand, a bootstrap replicate is created by randomly sampling over those thousand examples, but you sample with replacement instead of sampling without replacement. So if you sampled from a thousand storms without replacement, you would just get the, the whole set back. You just get the same thousand storms. But if you sample with replacement, that means each time you sample a storm, you take it out, but then you might sample that storm again. You might sample it two or three or four or five times in your set of a thousand. Um, so because of that sampling with replacement leads to duplicates, there's this 0 0.632 rule that I could prove mathematically, but I haven't bothered here. But on average, each bootstrap replicate ends up containing only 0 0.632 or 63.2% uh, of unique examples. So if you have a thousand storms in this original training set on the left, and then you create a bootstrap replicate of a thousand storms, on average, only 632 of those thousand storms are gonna be unique and the other, whatever the difference is, 368 will be duplicates. Um, and where this whole 0 0.632 thing comes from is one minus one over E. So this, this whole business of bootstrapping or example bagging, make sure that each tree is trained with a different set of unique examples. So that ensures diversity among the trees in your random forest. And then there's this other thing you do called predictor bagging or feature bagging or subsampling, whatever terminology you want to use. And that's where um, at each branch node in, in each tree inside the random forest, instead of looping over all the predictors you have to find the best question, you only loop over a small subset of the predictors you have to find the best question. So say you have um, in this very, uh, very specific example, let's say that you have 41 predictors. Um, the, the default rule inside a random forest is at each branch node, you, uh, you randomly sample M to the one half or, or square root of M predictors from all the M predictors that you have and you only ask questions about those predictors. So for example, if you had 41 predictors, the square root of 41, if you round to the nearest integer, it rounds down to six, 6.3 something. Um, so if you had 41 predictors at each branch node, you would randomly select six of those 41 predictors, ignore the other 35, and to find the best question at that branch node, you only loop over the six predictors that you've randomly subset out of the 41. That's another way to ensure diversity among the trees in a random forest. So there's example bagging and predictor bagging. That makes sure that the individual trees are different enough that when you ensemble them together, you're not just ensembling uh, the, the same tree a hundred or a thousand times. You're ensembling different trees that overfit in different ways and hopefully complement and offset each other. So shown below, again, uh, this, this link goes to the code that's in a Jupyter notebook. So these are results on the training data for a random forest that I've trained in Python. I use close to the default hyperparameters for this random forest. The number of trees is 100 here. The class is called, it's from scikit-learn again, it's called sklearn.ensemble.randomforestclassifier. 
if you had a regression problem, you'd use random forest regressor instead. Scikit-learn does both. And it does multi-class classification with random forest, so it's super flexible. Um, and I'm sticking with the same problem that I had in sections two and three for the single decision trees. So the prediction task is, will the storm develop strong rotation in the future, which is defined by this super exact threshold on vorticity. So here I'm looking at results of the random forest on the training data. The rock curve has an AUC of 0.917. The performance diagram has a maximum CSI critical success index of about 0 0.4. And the attributes diagram, it doesn't perfectly follow the x equals y line. It actually has an underprediction problem instead of an overprediction problem, but it's pretty close to the x equals y line. And the Briar skill score is good. Any Briar skill score greater than zero means you're doing better than climatology, and this is quite a bit greater than zero. So now I'll flip forward to the validation data. I'll flip back and forth between these two slides a couple times so you can convince yourself that the results in the training and validation data are not very different at all. Um, I didn't put confidence intervals on these, uh, these curves, but I suspect very, very strongly that if I did put confidence intervals on these curves, there'd be no significant difference between the training and validation data. Um, either way, the, the perceptible difference by just flipping back and forth between these figures is tiny, which means that overfitting is not a big problem for this random forest. Um, as we went from the training to the validation data, the AUC dropped by 0 0.004. The maximum CSI actually increased by a little bit and the Briar skill score dropped by a little bit, 0 0.007. But like I said, chances are that none of these differences are significant. So random forests do not have the overfitting problem that single decision trees do. So finally, section five, I'm gonna talk about gradient boosted forests for a few minutes and then I'll summarize and take questions. So gradient boosting from this, uh, this paper by Friedman in 2002 is where it was first introduced. It's another way of ensembling decision trees. So in a random forest, if you have 100 trees, however many trees you have, it doesn't matter. The trees are all trained independently of each other, which is nice because it's computationally fast. You can train every one of your decision trees in parallel. So if you have 100 trees and 100 computing cores, you can train one tree on each core. It goes really, really fast. It takes the same amount of time as training one decision tree. Um, conversely, in a gradient boosted forest, which I'm abbreviating here is GBF, the kth tree is trained to predict, to predict the residual or the error from the first k minus one trees. So this, uh, this figure that I've taken from a blog is a little schematic of that. So for your first decision tree, you, you train the first decision tree the way you normally train any decision tree. So you're trying to predict um, whatever your variable of interest is. So if you're trying to predict um, the probability of severe weather, that's your first decision tree is just gonna do that. But then your second decision tree is gonna look at the errors of the first decision tree. And instead of fitting the, the, actual, um, the actual label, which is the occurrence of severe weather, which is a yes or no, the second decision tree is going to fit the errors from the first decision tree. And then once you fit the second decision tree, you now have a forest of two. And the third decision tree will, will be trained to fit the residual from the first two decision trees. And then the fourth tree is trained to fit the residual from the first three trees, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of, instead of training every decision tree in the forest to, uh, to predict, predict the actual phenomenon, um, each tree after the first is being fit to the error from the trees that came before it. And the examples are also weighted so that the examples with the greatest error from the first k minus one trees have the greatest weight when you're training the kth tree. So you really care about the examples for which the first k trees are really, really direly wrong. Hmm. And in practice, this often leads to a better prediction than random forests. Here I'm showing you another figure that I've taken from a blog where um, if you didn't understand the first figure or the first explanation, hopefully this makes it a little bit clearer. So as, as you go along, you, um, the, the, the thing inside the, uh, inside the black rectangle is where your, um, that's, that's where the labels are coming from for the new tree. So you're running, uh, so for this, this little schematic at the top, you've trained one tree now you're finding the residuals from that first tree and then you're training the second tree to fit those residuals. Then you have two trees and you're training the third tree to fit the residual from the first two, et cetera, et cetera. 
and ideally your error keeps going down as you keep adding trees to the forest. Um, so for random forests, I talked about example bagging and predictor bagging. Gradient boosted forests can also use example bagging and predictor bagging. So they can train each tree with a different bootstrap replicate of the training data. And uh, they can subset the predictors that you try asking questions about at each branch node. But in most libraries, I found the default for a gradient boosted forest is not to do example bagging or predictor bagging. So you can do it or you cannot do it. It's one of those hyperparameters you can play with and see what works best for you. Um, like I said earlier, in a random forest, all the trees are trained in parallel because they're independent of each other. That makes random forests really fast to train, whereas in a gradient boosted forest, the trees have to be trained in series. You need the first tree to train the second one, you need the first two to train the third, you need the first k minus one to train the kth tree. So that makes them a little bit slower. And if you, um, if you end up running code in the Jupyter notebook that I've linked to, you'll see that it takes maybe a minute to train the random forest and five to train the gradient boosted forest. Um, but the nice thing, as I alluded to earlier about gradient boosted forests, is that they usually do better than random forests. There was a recent contest for solar energy prediction, which you can read about in this paper. The full reference is at the end of my slides from McGovern et al. 2015. It was a contest to predict solar energy, and the top three teams in that contest all were people who used gradient boosted forests. This was before the explosion of deep learning, so maybe using deep learning would have ended up doing better. Um, so the last couple slides on gradient boosted forests are uh, analogous to the ones that I showed you for random forests, where I've just trained a gradient boosted forest in Python, and now I'm showing you the examples on the train, or I'm showing you the results rather on the training data and then on the validation data. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna read all the numbers off the figures here. I'm just gonna flip back and forth between the two slides. And once again, by looking at the tiny differences between these two slides, you can probably convince yourself that the training results aren't very different from the validation results. Um, there's little differences as you go from training to validation data. The AUC drops a bit, the maximum CSI increases a bit, and the Briar skill score decreases a bit. But uh, if I had put confidence intervals on here, my suspicion is that none of these differences are significant. Uh, so finally, to summarize, decision trees can solve a regression problem where, for example, you want to predict the exact hail size for a storm or a classification problem where you want to predict categories like severe hail, significant severe hail, whatever it may be. And decision trees do this using a series of yes or no questions, those questions that are asked at each branch node. The main advantage of decision trees is human readability. So in that schematic that I showed you throughout where I, I had the um, cape equals uh, cape greater than or equal to 1500 joules per kilogram and a few other questions in there, it's very human readable. It's very intuitive. You can understand exactly how the decision tree is making its decisions. Um, the big disadvantage of single decision trees is they commonly overfit, which you saw. The overfitting can be mitigated by ensembling a bunch of decision trees together using a random or gradient boosted forest. The disadvantage of random and gradient boosted forests is they're not human readable anymore. So the individual trees are, you can still plot each tree in your forest like that schematic I showed you at the beginning and look at all the questions being asked, but good luck doing that for a hundred or a thousand trees and figuring out how all the predictions from the individual trees are ensembled together. So you'll still be able to understand an individual tree in the forest, but um, to, to look at a hundred or a thousand of them and understand how they go together is a pretty daunting task for our human cognition system. Um, so there's the interactive code that I've been referring to throughout. The full link to it is there in the, uh, the second bullet point from the bottom. And that's a full Jupyter notebook where you can, uh, you can tweak the code, run it interactively, do your own experiments. And here's a short list I'll emphasize this is a really short list because there's probably been hundreds of papers now, but a list with applications of decision trees and random and gradient boosted forests and atmospheric science. So there's some uh, reading material for you if you'd like it. And then there's a list of full references at the very end of my slides. And uh, I'll stop for questions now. I think the way this is working is someone else puts the questions on their screen, right? Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, and also the to answer your Question earlier, the slides will be shared afterward uh, on, the court, on the summer school website and all the talks are being recorded. So they'll be posted on YouTube later. So you, you'll be able to directly go click on his links and we'll have to 
rewind the, the live stream or anything like that. So yep, go ahead and take it away on the questions. Okay, so I see the first question is uh, from Heather. Is there an existing Python package I'm using to plot the rock curves and performance diagrams? Um, yeah, the Python package is my own. There's other Python packages that do it, but to add the, the contours and stuff in the background, that's my own code. If you send me a message afterwards, I put my Twitter handle and an email on the slides. I'd be glad to share that code with you. Um, question from uh, Catherine, the full reference for the Quinlan 1986 paper is on the last slide. Question from Zhen Dong, is the yes, no binary splitting for classification? Um, how does a regression tree split? Both types of decision trees ask a yes, no question at each branch, regardless of whether your output variable is a yes, no thing or not. Um, these questions keep moving. Uh, question from Aqing. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. What is the relationship between decision tree complexity, the size of the data, and the number of input variables? Does the decision tree complexity increase with data? Um, yeah, the, it, it depends on what you mean by complexity, but the, if, if you mean the depth of the decision tree, which I suspect that you do, you can grow a deeper decision tree when you have more data, more examples to put into it. So if you only have a hundred or a thousand storms, you can't grow a very deep decision tree because you're going to get down to the point where each leaf node only has one or two storms used to make the prediction. But if you've got a million storms, you can grow a much deeper decision tree because you can still have hundreds or thousands of storms being used to make the prediction at each leaf node. Um, from Raghu330, can we ask two questions in each branch? No. Um, the, the standard answer is no. Although I suppose um, people have done weird things with decision trees where um, they've, they've made them fancier than the examples that I've shown you. So some people train decision trees that don't bifurcate. For example, you can have three splits at a branch node or four splits or five splits. Um, some people have, uh, Amy McGovern specifically, uh, developed something called spatio-temporal relational decision trees and spatio-temporal spatio relational random forests where the questions you can ask at each branch node are much more complicated than these thresholding questions that I've shown you. So there, it, there are fancier things you can do with decision trees, although the, uh, the vast majority of applications do the, um, they just ask those yes or no questions at each branch node, like the ones I've shown you. Um, do you, this is from James, do you or the algorithm decide where your questions go in the decision tree? For example, did you decide that the Cape question was the root node? No, I didn't. Um, I suspect that this question was asked before I got into describing the training procedure. So yeah, during the training procedure to determine the best question at each branch node, the training algorithm loops over all combinations of, um, of predictors and then thresholds on the predictors, and it finds the question that maximizes information gain, and that determines what the question ends up being at that branch node. Um, from Catherine, you presented an example of using decision trees for classification. Can you give an example of using decision trees for a regression problem? I apologize that I didn't have a regression problem in my examples. I hope that I explained it conceptually well enough when I was sort of, I, I was uh, code switching between predicting severe weather and predicting the exact size of hail that comes out of a storm. That would be a regression problem. And you would probably ask the, the predictor variables for that problem. Um, for predicting the exact size of hail versus predicting yes or no, will there be severe hail? The predictor variables would probably be very similar, but the, um, the particular questions at each branch node and whatnot would be a little bit different. And then at each leaf node to get your prediction, if, if you're trying to predict exact hail size, for example, uh, at, at, a, at a given leaf node, let's say 100 storms from the training set reach that leaf node to um, to predict the, the hail size for any future storm that reaches that leaf node, you would just average the hail sizes over all the storms in the training set that reach that leaf node. So if you had 100 storms in the training set that reached that leaf node and their average hail size was 2.1 centimeter diameter, you would, um, for any future storm that reaches that leaf node, you predict 2.1 centimeter diameter hail. Um, a question from some guy, can you please elaborate more on the bootstrap sampling? Uh, again, I assume that question was asked before I talked about the bootstrap sampling a little bit more. 
So the bootstrap sampling means that each tree in the random forest is trained with a bootstrap replicate of all the examples that you have available in the data set. And on average, a bootstrap replicate only contains 63.2% unique examples, and then the other ones are duplicates. And that allows the bootstrap replicate to be different for each tree in the forest, which, it, which allows you to have diversity among the trees in your forest. Um, question from Philippe. How to choose random forests versus gradient boosted forests for a problem? Differences in generalization between random and gradient boosted forests. Um, oh boy, that, I don't know if I have a great answer for that. Uh, based on the experience that I've had using the two types of forests and based on the experience from reading the literature, it seems like gradient boosted forests usually outperform random forests. Although uh, generally the difference isn't huge. I have found that um, I've, I've had more overfitting problems with gradient boosted forests than random forests, not huge ones, but every once in a while I get gradient boosted forests that significantly overfit, whereas I don't think I've ever seen, at least in my applications, a random forest that overfits. Um, question from Mike McFerrin. Can you explain in gradient boosted forests what you mean by training on the residuals? i.e. is the n plus one tree just trying to predict the errors of the previous n trees? Yes. So when you're predicting, for, just to make this concrete, let's say you're, uh, you're training the 10th tree in the forest. So you already have nine trees in the forest. You ensemble those first nine trees to make a prediction for each one of your training examples. And then what the 10th tree is trying to predict is the error from the first nine trees. So the, er the tenth tree predicts the error from the nine tree forest and the eleventh tree predicts the error from the ten tree forest, et cetera, et cetera. Um, questions from Victor, how big should the n instance be? Um, that's, that's kind of a million dollar question. Uh, the, the answer to that varies wildly depending on the problem you're trying to solve and how much noise there is in your data set, et cetera. Um, th there's, there's lots of different ways to, to figure out if, if you have enough, um, enough examples in your training set or not. But probably the, um, the gold standard is once you've trained your model, if you're going to, um, if your model is going to be used in the wild, for example, in a weather office or something, you, uh, if once you take your trained model and implement it in real time, if, if it performs well, um, over all seasons and all times of day and all the spatial areas that you care about and it performs well in the extremes, uh, that, that means that you have a good model that's, that's general enough and that means your training set was large enough. Um, but to, to determine that before putting your model into the wild, uh, there's a whole bunch of different things you have to look at. So I would recommend, uh, I always recommend doing really thorough model evaluation to figure out the answer to that question. So splitting up your model evaluation by time of day and time of year and spatial area and making sure it does well in the extremes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's no, there's no one answer to how big your training set has to be. It varies um, depending on so many factors. So, okay, question from Tse Chun. It is not clear to me why the gradient boosted forest mitigates overfitting. Could you elaborate on this? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think the, the reason gradient boosted forests mitigate overfitting is that um, as in a random forest, the trees in a gradient boosted forest are diverse. But the way you make trees in a gradient boosted forest diverse is different than the way you make trees in a random forest diverse. So for a random forest, you have that, um, that example bagging and predictor bagging. Whereas, like I said, you typically don't do that in a gradient boosted forest, although you can. I think what makes um, each tree in a gradient boosted forest different from the rest is that the, um, for each tree, the examples are weighted differently. So even though each tree in a gradient boosted forest is being trained with all the examples in your training set, the, uh, the examples have different weights in each tree. So each tree emphasizes a different set of training examples. So it's, it's kind of like example bagging, but not quite. Uh, question from uh, Ryan before, before you no. jump into the next question uh, can you uh, do one more question and then we'll we'll wrap up uh, we'll be able to, we'll be able to, to answer, answer more questions at the um, panel session at 1 30. Sure I'll just go with the top question then it's from uh, Qin Shui uh, how to physically understand the second tree that is fitting the error of the first tree in gradient boosted forests 
Um, I'm not sure what you mean by physically understand. I can, I can explain it mechanistically so I can explain what's happening during the training procedure. So you're taking the first tree, using that to make a prediction for all your training examples, and then you're finding the errors or residuals, and then the second tree is predicting the errors or residuals that are coming out of the first tree. But how to physically understand it, um, that's, that's a really good question. I, th I think the answer is that it's, it's much harder to physically understand a model that's predicting the error of a different model instead of a model that's just predicting the, the label or the outcome itself. Um, so any sort of physical understanding there is going to be more difficult to obtain. There are different interpretation methods that you can apply to machine learning models to figure out what's going on under the hood. And that's going to be the subject of a future lecture in the summer school. So uh, hopefully that lecture can answer your question because I don't, um, I don't think I have enough time to go into uh, machine learning interpretability here. All right. Uh, with that, let's thank Ryan one more time, uh, and as well as thank, let's thank Dory for uh, again for her talk earlier too.